What is up team? Welcome back to the Dennis Who Invest podcast. And you know what? Every podcast episode is special, but this one is super duper duper special and contemporaneous today because I have none other than famous face, shall we say, Paul Mitta sat in front of me because he's currently on TV on The Apprentice and we're all on the edge of our seats to see how Paul is doing and progressing in the series week in, week out. Uh, and of course, it is important to preface everything that we're about to say today with the, with, the, with, the, with the fact that contemporaneously, we are currently on episode number five, which, yeah, yeah, just is, finish on, which is actually going to be broadcast tonight as we're shooting this podcast on the 29th of uh, February 2024. So very important to preface everything that we're about to say with there will be no spoilers for anybody who's listening who that may or may not be on your mind. We're going to say that right here, right now. This is going to be about Paul, who he is, his journey, what led him to become, go on The Apprentice and his plans for the future. And I'm super, 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 duper excited for this episode today. Paul, how are you? Yo, I'm really good. I mean, uh, life's just going at a million miles per an hour right now. I'm not going to lie to you. It's um, literally one thing after another. But when when you reached out uh, for this podcast, it was something that I really wanted to do because I do believe and we were discussing this previously that, you know, a lot of dentists come out of dental school. There's an abundance of clinical education out there. But in terms of business or financial education, especially when it comes to the speciality of dentistry, there's nothing really out there. And people have to kind of ad hoc learn as you go along. Um, like whether you should be a limited company, uh, whether you stay self-employed as a sole trader. Um, and for me, it was something that I really struggled with of how do I make sure that I'm making the most out of what I'm earning and what do I need to do for the future in order to protect myself as well. Um, because if you could think about these things early, then, you know, you're going to safeguard yourself. 100%, mate, you know, and this is the thing, and I always preach this on the podcast episodes, you know, money is not the be all and end all, but it's, yeah. it's merely a means to an end to perpetuate your goal and mission on the surf, whatever it is, and have more freedom, which is a beautiful yeah, exactly. way of looking at it. I think if you chase money, you'll find that the if you think that money is going to bring you happiness, then you'll find that that is unfortunately unlimited because you'll never reach the end point um, and you'll constantly keep chasing. I mean, you might earn 2K a month and you'll want to earn 4K a month. You'll earn 4K a month and you want to earn 6K a month and it's so forth, so forth. It never ends. I think what what I truly personally value um, are the experiences that I have with the close relationships around me. And I think that's the most fulfilling thing you can ever have. This has gone quite deep, quite quick. <laughs> wow, I know. <laughs> it's like, you know what? You know what, though, right? Because when I am fortunate enough to interview people on the podcast, a lot of people who I interview, they share these same beliefs and they share these same thoughts and perspective on money that I do because they're people that have made progress in that world. Are you with me? And it's important to remember that not everybody has had that opportunity yet, which is actually part of the reason that I made Dennis Invest. It's about mm -hmm. education. It's about helping everybody understand these concepts and principles, not so they can change, but at least they have the choice as to whether or not to adopt them into their philosophy and into their life, which is a really- Give them the knowledge and what they do with that knowledge is their choice. Well, then you're empowered, aren't you? But anyway, Paul, it got real deep, real fast. And I love that <laughs> stuff. I love that stuff. No, no, I love it as well. I could talk about that all day. So uh, and maybe we should not go off on that tangent. <laughs> Let's come back for air. Let's come back yeah. up for air for two seconds. Because <laughs> Paul, There'll be a lot of people who are watching The uh, Apprentice and they've got to know you a little bit through watching the series and what have you. And people that will have known you before The Apprentice, of course, maybe it might be nice if we did a little bit of a bio about Paul just generally so that we can bring everybody up to speed. I think that would be wonderful. First of all, first important thing to say is Dr. Paul is one of us dentists who is listening to this show. He's a dentist just like us, which is really cool. Yeah, no, so uh, guys, my name is Dr. Paul Midder. I'm from Leeds, uh, went to Uni of Sheffield, graduated in 2018, done a postgraduate diploma in restorative and aesthetic dentistry distinction level. And uh, I'm the owner of the Vici Dental Group, which are two dental practices in Leeds itself. I used to work at Square Mile Dental Center in central London, commuting uh, every week, which was not easy, I can tell you that. Uh, but that was the thing that really changed um, my kind of whole clinical experience, let's say. I'm um, also the course director for the Manchester Smile Dental Academy, where we uh, uh, run multiple diplomas for, you know, 100 delegates per weekend, uh, education, clinical dentistry, 
research, networking, the things that I'm really passionate about. And it's kind of what's led me to this point here. Hey, that's cool, man. And I think, well, correct me if I'm wrong, there's kind of two fears. There's two, there's two arms to our education for me whenever it comes to success in dentistry. The first one is the dentistry itself. And then the second one is like business or recognizing how we can maximize the leverage that we can obtain with this first skill set. And they actually both complement each other. I don't think you could put that second skill set in a box. You touched upon it just there. Networking, getting yourself out there, running courses, etc. All of those things. Public speaking is like throwing petrol in the bonfire whenever it comes to a lot of those things. So you touched upon it just there, which was wonderful. Can I just ask what planted that seed in your head that made you realize how powerful this stuff is? Yeah, so for me, I came across two very incredible people that are extremely important in my life to this day, Jin and Kish from Smile. And um, I met them and I saw what they were doing. And I realized, and do you know, the first thing they ever said to me, they said, Paul, the most important thing is to be the best clinical dentist that you can be for yourself. That's the most important thing. And then every, but everything else, you can't just, you can't just do that though. That's one, as you said, one branch of a tree, you could say. Um, you also need to make sure that you put yourself out there enough to network, get to know other professionals, because that's how you're going to grow as a dental professional overall. You, you being a dental professional isn't just subjugated to your clinical dentistry. It is about everything that you're doing. It's, um, it's are you attending events? Are you going to conferences? Are you learning from peers? Are you involved within the community? Um, all of these things are, are so important in bringing what you should be as a dental professional. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. They actually complement each other. And I mm -hmm. can remember a time back in the day where I thought being the best version of yourself when it came to being a dentist was just to understand as much about teeth as you mm -hmm. possibly can. And I really feel like it's easy to fall into that rabbit hole teeth tunnel vision i call it i was definitely that person and no, then no. same yeah man. Same. i was that person as well but then you realize there's actually so much more to it that is the core foundation and that foundation needs to be really strong but then you got to start building a building awesome well you know what it's so great to hear you say that because when it's delivered via someone else not just me then <laughs> the two people are saying the same thing you know they're telling the truth <laughs> oh well there you go they complement each other that's true as well yeah. awesome mate so tell me this so you came out of university associate dentist and then you met Jin and Kish who are out there in the dental world right we've seen them smile academy smile group all of that and then you thought to yourself right there's actually a little bit more to it than teeth which I totally agree with my friend big part of the message of dentistry investors to say and then you thought to yourself, oh, wow, my eyes are opened. What was yeah. the next move? What was the next move? Yeah, so when I realized that, I thought, um, I when I left university, I did FD training, and I worked two days a week in an NHS practice and two days a week in a private practice. And I was building a list in my NHS practice, and I was just exhausted. Every day I'd come home, I'd be exhausted. I mean, I was seeing 40, 50 patients a day. Um, and I was just really struggling with that kind of work-life balance. I was constantly thinking about uh, patients that I've seen that day in terms of, uh, have I done the right treatment? Should I have done this? Um, constantly overthinking. And I thought to myself, well, I've realized at that point that I'm not at that level where I should be in my career. Um, and the only way I'm going to do it is by going on courses. And also um, I need that kind of in-house mentorship for someone to be able to guide me to the person that I want to be. And then, um, so that was six months worth. And then in February, 2020, now it's a really important date, February, 2020. I got, virus. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I got a call yeah. from, uh, Nick Sethi in central London and he goes, Paul, and he, he's an incredible clinician, by the way, Abs and him and his brother, Sanjay Sethi, incredible clinicians. And he said, Paul, do you know what? Uh, we want to offer you a role at square mile dental for two days a week. And it was too good of an opportunity to turn down. So I left my jobs. And then March 2020 happened and obviously the lockdown happened. So I ended up with, with literally, I had nothing. I had nothing. I wasn't earning. I wasn't doing anything. So um, obviously you've got bills to pay, right? Uh, so I did the test and trace. I was doing that for like 10 hours a day um, just, to, just to be able to kind of save up for anything that I wanted to do. But what I did at the same time when the first lockdown was over, I started locuming uh, loads of different practices. 
And what I realized was what makes a good practice a good practice? And what are the things, because sometimes in order to find the right practice for you, you have to understand, you have to go through what you didn't like about certain practices. Um, so I did that for quite a while. And eventually that led me to buy my own practice in August, 2021. And that's when that's when the journey really starts. <laughs> oh, and I'm intrigued to learn about that next leg as well. But I'm actually so pleased that you, you paused then for just two seconds, because the reason why was I wanted to jump in with an analogy on what you just said. You know how you were saying that you have to basically kiss a few frogs in order to find your Prince Charming, yeah, so to yeah, speak, really whenever did. it comes to dental practices. I love this is the analogy that I love, right? How do you know that your favorite meal in your favorite restaurant is your favorite meal in your favorite restaurant? not tried anything else you've got to try everything else on the menu bro right you got to have context <laughs> it's so true everything else is the same anyway mate anyway i'm intrigued to hear about the next leg no like one one thing that i always do and this is something i pride myself on i always try and transmutate anything that negative that happens and i try and turn it into a positive um because things don't happen to as they happen for us either it's a lesson or it's a blessing um and that mindset has always carried me through uh, when I took over my the city centre practice in Leeds, uh, I literally had one hundred pound left in my bank account. Um, I had nothing. I, I saved all my money for the deposit, gave it all away, and uh, that was that was hard times. But I had a composite bonding patient come in, and um, I said, "Do you mind coming back in a month? I just need to be able to afford the materials." I just told her straight, and she was like, "Yeah, fine, no worries." Um, so that was yeah, it went well, but. That was quite a quite a moment where I thought, have I done the right thing? And the practice was, um, let's say, quite a, a classical style of practice. And, um, you know, then I went through a refurb. And uh, but at the same time, I was still working in London. So I was still doing two days a week in London and three days a week at this practice uh, because I still realized that I can learn. There's only so much you can learn from yourself you learn the most by learning from other people's failures, other people's mistakes. And, you know, one thing about Nick, for example, he's so open about the mistakes that he's made in the past. And uh, he taught me a lot in regard to that. Uh, so I wanted to keep that going for a bit. Um, but yeah, commuting down to central London every week for two years was uh, was tiring to say the least. But again, when respect, I look back- man. Respect though. Yeah. Uh, not not quite where you are, Dubai, but maybe one day. <laughs> that's the next leg. That's the next that's leg. Nice, yeah, yeah, another leg. Yeah, hopefully soon. That's the fourth leg or something. <laughs> there we go. Love it, my man. Cool. So you set up the practice. Hmm. There's a bit of a squeeze. And just yeah. as what you were saying as well, you know, these like tough things that we go through, you know, tough inverted commas, because actually the reason they feel tough is because we're gaining wisdom. So exactly. you can take, you can take that to the next, cause here's the thing, right? You know, the stuff that you do day to day was literally once upon a time tough to you, but you never would have learned how to negotiate that until you push through that. Are you with me? So you actually gain skills and wisdom and knowledge through doing that. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that that process is actually how we feel. You know, this stuff already, but it's more for no, the, no, but it's, it's nice to hear again. It's, to be honest. it's, it's kind of taking it to the next level, isn't it? Right. Cause if you can literally reframe that, not only is something tough, but actually is something in which you're learning. Then here's the thing, you can take that to the next level and say, actually, maybe I should seek those situations out to a degree because I'm actually becoming better and improving. Just another way of looking at it that I really like. It's a really cool thing to remind yourselves of in those sorts of situations. Anyway, you were saying, Paul, practice started, 100 pounds in the bank account, just about <laughs> making ends meet. What happened? Mate, literally. Um, so... Then I had a vision, you know, I knew exactly what I needed to do from the experiences that I learned. I knew that I needed to utilize the clear line of booming market at the time as well. Um, so I started doing ads and things like that to get the practice going. And uh, so I bought the practice for £175,000. That was the value. And 15 months later, it was valued at £900,000. Um, just because I quadrupled the turnover, we went from three members of staff, including myself, to 20 members of staff. Wow. Um, and we just kept growing and growing. And um, I think the main thing for me that I learned was you got to pick the right members for your team. Uh, you know, each member of my team is a reflection of myself. And uh, it's so important to be able to delegate things because you can't do it all yourself. You, you can't. And that's something that at the start I really tried to do and you end up burning yourself out. Um, so now we're at the point where I've got people um, in, a, in a hierarchy set up where 
you know, that they just do their roles so well. And what's nice is they treat the business as their own. Um, and and it's, it's beautiful to see at times. So even when I'm not there, you know, it's still running at 100 percent efficiency. So, um, yeah, if I could give one advice to anyone, you've got to have the right team around you. Otherwise, you're not going to go anywhere in life. Love that, Pearl. It's very true. Hire, hire, wait, what, what way around is it? Hire, slow, fire, fast, something along those lines. Yeah, that's it. 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 Hire, it's, slow, it's, fire, fast. I like it. it. I know that one, actually. That's a good one. Oh, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> I can't, I might, I might. Next time in the boardroom, I might use that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mr. Sugar, do you know something? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah by the way. <laughs> might get the yeah, like, that point. yeah, I'm sure he'll really appreciate that as well. I'm sure he'll really appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, that's I can't claim it's my own. I definitely heard that from somebody at some stage. It's it's a, it's a saying that does the rounds, which is very true. Classics are classics for a reason, right? Exactly, exactly. No, I couldn't yeah. agree more. So the business is running itself, right? Mm -hmm. And I I feel like I can anticipate where this is going. That's when you got that to a level where you're like, right, things are slick. We're looking good, and the mm -hmm. entrepreneur in you was like, nah, I want more, right? Yeah. You know what um, I always say, uh, life's a bit like, you know, the QRST um, line where on an ECG, oh. um, if you're, if you're plateauing, then you're almost flatlining. So the key thing is you always got to be growing. So if you ever think you've hit that level where you're starting to get comfortable, that's when you got to push even harder. Um, so I'm always trying to break ceilings um, that are present because I think, you know, you only get life like this once. Um, so it's time to do things that, you know, others may have thought was impossible, but, um, you know, I, I am extremely ambitious in that way. And, uh, this, the sky is not the limit. I'll keep going. And even with this apprentice for me, uh, the way I see it is it's a foundation. It's a stepping board. Um, we've got loads of plans coming up for the future. So, um, but let's track it back. So practice running well, uh, put an offer for a second practice as well worth, uh, 1.1 million. Uh, to expand the group and uh, I had this idea I've always had this idea because my dad is very successful in textiles and I always thought that to get good scrubs you got to get you know from figs or America or anything like that and the shipping fees why not create a brand that is high quality antimicrobial antibacterial etc within the UK um, with the network that has been amassed and I thought, well, obviously dentistry is a service-based industry and I've learned to do that well over, over the past five, six years. Um, but I, I don't have any experience in a product-based industry. When, and it was New Year's Eve of 2022, I didn't go out, I didn't do anything. And I was on my laptop on Lad Bible, actually, weirdly enough. And <laughs> the apprentice came up and I just clicked on it. I thought, you know what? What's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? Um every nothing to lose everything to gain so i applied and uh yeah managed to get in after a rigorous uh, audition process so yeah wow and the rest is history and now you're on the and show then, yeah and then and then the the games truly began after that <laughs> wow okay cool well listen i tell you what i like about this podcast it's it's like a story almost which is beginning cool. middle end. this is it right and you know you've told your story about how you felt, what inspired you, and what have you, right up to the point where we got on to the the, the the apprentice and what have you. Let's talk about the interview process. Or sorry, not the, well. Just to be clear, the interview process for the candidates, as in before they make it on the show. Are you with me? Yeah. You said it was rigorous. How does it look? The well, the the first round was um was kind of mini stages. So there was fifteen of us in a room. And they go, okay, stand up for 15 seconds and explain why you should be Lord Sugar's next business partner in front of everyone. So then if you make it to the next mini stage, someone takes you to the lift. And if you go up the lift, that's when you made it through to the next stage. If you go down the lift, then you know you're out of the building. Uh, so it's very dramatic, very, very dramatic. And, and you're waiting for the person to see which button they press. And sometimes they, they took the piss. <laughs> They'll go oh, like that. A bit like when Lord Sugar does his fingers. It's a bit, it's a bit like that. But um second stage was it, this was an interesting one because it was like a three minute mini interview and the guy goes tell me something about yourself that people wouldn't expect and i just said well i can body pop uh which is like a, um, a form of break dancing and he goes go go straight up <laughs> go straight up yeah uh so that was a bit of a uh, finally that skill came to use i've never really had a use for it so uh it came in handy 
third round this one was 20 minutes with a producer and um with one of lord sugar's current business partners and you had to explain your business plan and they're asking you very in-depth questions um including you know what your ebitda is predicted to be uh very almost the only way i could describe it is if you did a business studies oski that's the only way i could describe it um and once we had done that, then we had to do the final stage. Bear in mind, this had been like 12 hours up until this point um, where, you know, they're just asking you loads of random questions to see how you react under pressure. Um, and one thing about myself is I do not react under pressure. I'm fine. Um, I'm always quite chilled, quite laid back guy. Um, so I always take my time when I'm thinking about answers. You probably see that in the couple of episodes um i'm not going to say anything outrageous uh for no reason so yeah <laughs> respect my man that's cool well do you know what right that's just I the mean, first round by the way wait, wait, that's just the first round that's just the first round, round. Yeah. wow geez. yeah well do you know what i could hear when you were speaking then there was almost a little bit of just seeing if you had a personality somewhat yeah exactly yeah there's like body pop okay you can go straight up you're cool right you can yeah. dance yeah you know which is awesome and that's fine because they want tv don't they but then the second part is the ebitda of your business mm -hmm. because dennis we do not get we get we barely get taught about ebitda and dentistry before even uh, ebitda in, in, in an actual bit you know well i said yeah. business in other businesses is what i meant so it's, it's interesting that you say that actually because i had never heard of ebitda in dental school but it's actually the most important thing to know when it comes to dental practices everything is value or just general business everything is value through EBITDA and you need to know what multiplier it is depending on what model it is depending on what the valuation should be um and that, that is a very very important skill that I think every dentist should know let me tell you one thing I learned about and I don't want to make this podcast about me but it's more for the benefit of the listeners you know EBITDA in dentistry where it's like between it's between like four and eight really for lots of dental practices typically yeah. or at least that's what the, the brokers say you know and that's yeah. you know, what a part for yeah no, I'd, I'd agree I'd say like on a principal led model so if the principal is putting their earnings back into the practice about four times EBITDA but on an associate led model so there's uh, no principal the principal takes out his earnings um then I would say it's about eight times I'd agree yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so here's the thing. Actually, that's one of the luxuries of dentistry that the EBITDA are actually quite high relative to lots of businesses. You know, from what I see, you know, most businesses uh, where say it's just like a solopreneur and a few people who help them, they're lucky if they get like two EBITDA. Yeah, no, I was going to say, usually it's just EBITDA straight. <laughs> you don't even get a multiplier. Yeah, or, or just EBITDA straight. There is no multiplier. Yeah, you're lucky if you get two, right? And yeah. it's. The, the, the more and more you can move towards the actual business end of the scale where it runs itself is the higher the multiples become, which is why associate led practices have higher multiples than owner operator led. Are you with me? But anyway, so to bring that back to what you were saying, the EBITDA of your business proposal, that's why there's so many. What I'm getting at is there's layers to that and it's complicated. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. just dropped it in there, but it's actually it's, it's a drop in the ocean, you could say, um, because there are many, many layers to that. <laughs> There is, man. And okay, cool. So they must have liked uh, what you said uh, whenever it came to the, the numbers and what have you. So you've done your research. You've obviously put some time into the business proposal, like a lot of time. And really oh, a lot, a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, and time was very limited at, <laughs> at that point as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, if you're going on this, you always got to make sure that you've uh, bulletproofed everything. Um, mm -hmm. There's no point going in half-hearted, um, especially when it comes to this sort of process. Cool, man. Awesome. Well, here's the thing. You've given us a taster of the pre the, the interview process prior to becoming a candidate. And I'm sure we could probably talk like 10, 20 more minutes about those subsequent rounds. But I feel like there's enough in there for everybody to get a little bit of a flavor for what it's like, which is what was just one round. Really. <laughs> huh? I said, I that was literally just one round. There's a lot more rounds to it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Holy moly. We could probably make a podcast about those. But I know, literally one podcast about that. I, I reckon. So it sounds anyway. But you know what? Let's skip ahead to when you got the yes response. How did that look? Was it like a letter in the post one day? Uh, so it was, a, it was a Zoom chat like this, actually. Um, right. And, you know, we were just talking. And uh, I remember the head producer just going, you know what, Paul? unfortunately this time around you're going to need to take some time off work because you're going to be coming on the apprentice this season and i couldn't i couldn't believe it honestly i it was like imagine everything in life that you've done just boiling into one point that every experience you've ever done has led to one point in life 
and everything just felt so surreal golden ecstasy i can't even euphoric i can't even just give enough words or superlatives to be able to describe that feeling that experience and to be able to share that with the people that i love the most as well was uh, a joy in itself so yeah incredible hey man that's a once in a lifetime moment it was it will, i'll never forget it wow okay you know what's funny the pageantry of the show it doesn't even stop when the cameras are off they're having fun with the elevator buttons they're they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're teasing you they're doing it all they the are, yeah. they're having fun it's like the ethos of the whole flipping organization but it's, it's just kind of funny isn't it really like it's not even just for the cameras there's kind of like a little bit of horse that, that, that was just because they wanted to build some suspense they wanted to do it so for their own amusement i guess but fair play i'll probably do the same so <laughs> it's it's too juicy it's dangling right there yeah well. exactly anyway 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 okay cool so listen so they said yes and then presumably they whisked you off to london flipping harry potter hogwarts ask something along the lines right whirlwind then they put you in that house right mm -hmm. is that how it works yeah uh, no, so um, not too dissimilar. So once we had to do three days of isolation, which uh, probably the longest three days that I've ever experienced in my life because you couldn't really go outside. You, you had to make sure you didn't get ill, basically, because obviously COVID was still rife and you're getting COVID tests as well. Um, so if you were COVID tested positive, you'd be off, um, which, yeah, was quite scary, actually. Um, when So then it came to the day, the day, the apprentice day, and we had to go to the boardroom first. I remember I was last in and uh, we, the producer goes, look, you're all going to get your chance with Lord Sugar. This is your time to impress him. Um, say what you need to say. And I remember going in there, just seeing Lord Sugar, Karen and Tim just across the boardroom. And I, was, I got massive imposter syndrome, I'll be honest with you. I just thought, what am I doing? Why have I done this? What am I doing? I'm, I, it was because everything was just so new. Um, there's no comfortableness to it whatsoever. Um, and uh, when he let that, when he told us about that we're going to the Highlands for the first task, I was like, I, I, so nervous, so nervous. And luckily, you know, Verdi decided to be PM. Um, and then we got whisked away to the Highlands. So we hadn't been to the house or anything at this point because that that's the treat you get if you win the task or if you survive the first task. Wow. So they don't even tell you this stuff before they enter your room. So when you oh, guys yeah. react. You, it's pure. Uh, so much of it is is real. Like it's all pure reactions. Um, and the level of stress that you're going through during the task, because you're just trying to think. How am I going to make the best fit out of this task? What role do I need to do? How am I going to do it well? Um, but also. How can we mess? How could this go wrong? How can I avoid it getting to that point? And there's all these thoughts going around your mind constantly while the camera is pointing at your face. So, so uh, it's authentic, that part. It's, I think that's, those are your authentic reactions. 100%. 100%. Oh. So when we, when we, um, when it all went wrong in the Highlands, uh, those were, those were authentic reactions. Um, so, yeah. They do drop me in it though with those tasks though, right? It's, 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 you're up against it, yeah? You you are really up against it. I mean, you got what, like for uh, for example, uh, we were talking about the virtual escape room. We had to create a whole virtual escape room over two days. Uh, that's something done usually over two years. So with no experience in that sort of technology, but you just got to try and put your front foot forwards and just go for it really. My favorite part of the virtual escape room episode was when the the interviewers give Asif a moment to, oh, to laugh yeah. along with them. Yeah, <laughs> if, you know, if you had said it was surreal, then um, there could have been a whole different story. I mean, we might not have won that. So credit to him. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Respect. Uh, yeah, it just it tickled me because he was he was. They said, "Oh, you know, it's a joke, right?" And then he he seemed to uh well he was like nah it's not it's not a joke this is like deadly serious and then uh, there was a little bit of a, a disconnect at that stage but it was just quite funny but then i think That's his it. teammates they jumped in and saved them and helped them didn't they the thing is you know you know when you're like under that sort of pressure as well you mm. don't you're not almost thinking you're almost like you, you're almost just trying to stay to your own script in a way like this is what we've done this is what i'm trying to push um so it's almost very hard to adapt 
to what how the surroundings are adapting towards you so i can understand that moment i can yeah okay that. yeah no i hear you and that's the that's a good yeah that puts it into context really doesn't it so you know you're absolutely spot on you're absolutely spot on but yeah no so okay cool so you got the tasks you find out uh there and then on the day and uh there's absolutely no brief whatsoever beforehand they just tell yeah, you yeah. right then and there in the boardroom yeah yeah you get a little bit of information after the boardroom about you know the the, the market of what you're going into so because there's, otherwise you'd have no idea um so you get a little bit of information but you only get that information at that time so um you have to rely on your memory to be able to serve it well when it comes to like pitching and things like that yeah when you're when you're pitching that is the most nerve-wracking thing you can ever do i mean i thought uh, presenting your composite filling to a consultant was uh, nerve wracking. But uh, when you're pitching in front of business experts about an industry that you don't really have much idea about, that is a whole new level of nerve wracking. And and when we did the pitch on task three, they didn't show it, but I was actually talking for about eight minutes, um, just trying to keep it going because because uh, because the game was that long, to be fair. Um, so you're only ever going to see like a snippet of what, what actually happens. But I think so far, all the episodes have, you know, they've been very fair and they've just been condensed naturally because you can't put three days um, out there. So they, they're all very true to the way it's actually happened. I see. Awesome. Well, yeah, from what I could see in that episode, you did a good job of being the narrator of the, the medieval virtual reality game. <laughs> yeah. I had that. to make it entertaining. <laughs> it was not entertaining the game. So I thought, oh, let me put on a little bit of a, I was doing like a lecture. Uh, so I thought let's just try it as, as entertaining as possible. But listen, bro, that's a skill in itself. The show must go on. So flipping hats off to you. Hats off. Yeah, to no, you. I, I, I finally got finally got first win under the belt. I uh, didn't have to go to the losers' cafe, which was nice because that loser <laughs> that is horrible. Um, no man or woman should ever have to go to that losers' cafe because uh it's it's you're, you're you're so shattered you're so tired from everything that's gone on and basically your role is to try and make sure that you don't get thrown under the bus and make sure you slip it in there of what everyone else has done as well um so you, you've got to be really alert you got to be really like it's a game of chess and you've got to be three moves ahead totally hear you okay cool so when you're in that boardroom <clears throat> and let's say you've completed the task and the chips are just going to fall where they may at this stage. It's done, right? You come into the boardroom, Karen, Tim, and Lord Sugar, and they're all sat there. The key, do you know what I realize? The key is you've got to chime in at the right time. You've got, you, if you, you're too overbearing, you're opening yourself up to liability. But if you chime in, get your point across at the right time, then, um, so saying too much will do you over, saying too little will do you, you've got to find a balance. That's my, little That's my little nugget. I like that. Speaking as an yeah. art, man. Big time, man. Big time. Yeah, let, can't be done. Less is more. But, um, this this last task, which was uh, episode four, Jersey, that was a really good one. Um, I, I just thought, you know what? Now it's time to make a statement Um, take no prisoners. And uh, I had a, because I did um two negotiations on this task. And I just thought, no matter what, I've got to beat the other team. Uh, the other team got really strong negotiators. Um, so, so I went to town and used all the skills I learned, learned, learned in dentistry and things like that. So all the not, uh, communication core skills <laughs> that I've been on in the past, uh, to try and try and get those down as possible. Hey, sweet. Well, you know what I, truth be told. So as we as we just to reiterate what we were saying earlier, we're shooting this episode, this is podcast episode right here on the eve of episode number five, uh, which is, I don't know how much I can say about episode number five. Uh, so we're allowed to say whatever we want because this is going to get released tomorrow, right? Oh, got you. Okay, so it's on it's on electric cars, right? Isn't it? We're yeah. So um, we we go down, and uh, I'm a big Formula One fan. I love Formula One. So Team Lewis Hamilton's all the way, and I'm going to go to. Oh, hopefully, I get to go to Silverstone this year. But when I saw the Formula E cars, I, I was like, "This is my task. This is my task. I, I'm definitely going to be PM for this." Um, but I got switched over from Team Nexus to Team Supreme. And um, so it was kind of me against Trey as PMs. And I had a vision. I had a vision, a really strong vision. I thought, this is how we're going to do the ad. Basically, if 
petrol cars are not going to be a thing uh, from 2040, I think the government said, or I know it keeps changing, then Formula E could be one of the biggest motorsports in the world. So I wanted to play on the fact that this could be the next Formula One in that regard um, and really pu push the fact that, you know, our ethos is about reducing air pollution, etc. Had a really clear vision, but then it all went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing because i know this is getting released tomorrow but i also don't want to ruin it for you uh, i kind of want to uh yeah i kind of want to keep the surprise for you as well but um I, do you know i said it in the boardroom as well you know as an individual i don't think i deserve to be there but as the project manager you know i'm in charge of everything so i 100 percent deserve to be there yeah it is what it is man you know it's it's but listen hats off like bro like biggest thing i can say respect to anybody right is putting themselves out there. Are you with me? You know, but and when I say that, going on the show, putting a hand up to be the PM, all of that. I don't even know how the episode goes, by the way, for anybody who's listening to this. I haven't even seen episode four, man. I don't know what. No, what's going mean. on, James? What's what does that on? make me as a host? Come on, that's dropping the ball big time right there. But yeah, oh, I have seen one highlight of episode four, and it's something about clams and the or, or oysters. Oh, oysters, oysters, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's what it is, right? And of course, you knows. Lord Sugar knows about oysters because he's a man of refined taste, right? And he's asking you these questions like, but were the oysters opened? And he knows yeah. like the price of oysters off the top of his head. And I'm like, he's, he's a man of culture. He's, he's not like, he's not a front. He is actually like that. Uh, but yeah, I got a good, I saw a clip and then I got a good vibe that Lord Sugar paid you a compliment on that. So guess what? I'm going to watch that episode tonight and then I'm going to watch episode number five. No, no, definitely. Do you know, um, you know, you touched on Lord Sugar there. He, he is a very, very intelligent man very 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 intelligent man um ex so extremely successful and is someone that you know i look up to so just to be able to hear his words of wisdom in the board because it's interesting because when he's deliberating he's almost teaching you how he thinks and how he's processed the information of the task and that's how i would learn so as the tasks go on i just kept learning from all the way from task one to task five i just kept learning um, what his what his thought process was and how I can adapt my own thought process to someone that of his caliber. Um, so just being in that boardroom itself was an amazing learning experience for me. That's good. That's a good ethos, man. We're either winning or we're learning right here in all of these things. Big yeah, exactly. Big exactly. Big. Yeah. Awesome. Love that. Okay, cool. So one more cue about the show. I've mm -hmm. always just been curious to know this. You yeah, know, Lord right. Sugar right obviously when you come and meet him outside of you meeting him in the boardroom is he like really aloof or is he there like fraternizing with you guys or how, how does that work how is that done no yeah so you don't really see him outside the boardroom at all he's a very busy guy to be fair he's a very very yeah. busy guy yeah. so um you don't you don't really see him in the boardroom you only really see him when he's presenting tasks and in the boardroom itself um so yeah that's why when you're in the boardroom you try and make the most of it really Love that, man. Okay. Well, well, cool. Well, listen, Paul, you know what? It's actually, you've actually been really generous with uh, knowledge and what have you whenever, you know, with regards to the background of the show, because to, to, to preface, guys, for anybody who's listening to this, uh, I wasn't actually sure how much we could say. Let's pull it back to Dennis, yeah, with the remaining time that we have on this podcast. We talked about how Dennis, mm -hmm. well, we both really feel that they can benefit from exploring and expanding outside of dentistry. What would you say to those dentists right here, right now? Because Paul, we know how the dental community feel lots of them. A lot of them feel like they're trapped within dentistry to a degree. Lots of them love it, but lots of people feel like they have more to give, but they just don't know how. And there's a lot of trials and tribulations, let's say that in dentistry. I'm making it out like it's all bad. It's definitely not. But what I am one, I do, but at the same time, I do want to speak to people who feel like this because this is a pain point. And I was like this once upon a time. So I want to no, be- I was like it. I, I, I explained, yeah. you know, when I was in my first job, I felt, I felt that way as well, but- I want to be direct to these people. Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. I want to be direct, right? Listen, you've obviously stepped, you've, you've seen that, that reality, you've stepped outside of it. What would you say to those people, man? You know, one thing I'll always say is you are only limited by yourself. If you feel like you're going to work and you're feeling that anxiety before you go to work, then you know either you're not in the right place 
or that you need to change it up and you are responsible for your own life your own actions only you can change it i say always get if you're if you're wanting to level up get a mentor um if you're wanting to kind of learn new things go for it because no one anyone can take any way anything away from you but they can never take your education away from you um so and that's something my dad always taught me and that's something i've always lived my life by uh, hence why i'm always in courses or running courses <laughs> Um, so I always say, if you feel like that, it's time to make a change, contact whoever you need to contact and start changing your life today. Cause it's not going to happen by itself. I'm just letting that hang. I didn't you? you like, <laughs> I'm just letting that hang, man. Okay. Fair, fair. Cool. You know, you, um, James, if you don't mind, I'd actually like to say something to the dental community, if that's okay. Hell yeah. Um, man. Let's go. You know, before... I was deciding on whether to go on this process. Uh, a lot of the decision was based on how I will represent the dental community because I know uh, the dental community is a very respected profession. It's a very tight knit community, and something that um, you know is one of my uh, is one of the best things that I get to do is to be around uh, like minded peers and and grow in that way. Um, so it was always a worry about how the dental community was going to take. Uh, me being on the show but it's been so incredibly supportive so thank you to each and every one of you that have messaged that are supporting um that are following me on my journey uh, there's been so much love i can't even begin to describe it so uh just a massive thank you to to the whole dental community from me wow man that's really 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 kind and appreciated you know <clears throat> and it's it's amazing that there is somebody who can be that person who's willing to step outside of the, the you know, of, of their comfort zone, you know, and, and, and be that person that people can look up to and say, wow, if he can do it, so can I, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's a dentist, just like all these other people out there. And like I was saying, just to just to bring it back to what I was saying earlier, the, 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 the pe people who feel like they are, they're, they only have one skill set in this dentistry, are, are you with me? You know, I mean, living proof that that's not necessarily the case. And that was a big part of the message of this podcast today is inspiration to let people see what is really possible. So yeah, man, I mean, right back at you. Uh, I think I speak for a lot of people who are in the dental community when I say those things that I've just said. And yeah, just excited for the future, your growth and where all of this is gonna go. And on that very topic, Paul, obviously staying within the remit of what we can and can't say at this present time, what does the future look like for you? So obviously I can't say what, what's gonna happen in the show or anything like that, I don't wanna ruin it for anybody, but. <laughs> Um, I would say in terms of kind of the dental practices this is something that we want to keep growing and we want to help our young dentists to be able to mentor them as well. Uh, I want to help grow the Smile Academy, but we've I've got something extremely exciting being released midway through 2025 that is going to change not only the dental world, not only the medical world, but the whole healthcare world altogether. So um, stay tuned for that. Follow my journey because it's, it's going to revolutionize everything. So uh, it's all it's all in the works at the moment, but yeah, get excited. That's all I'll say. Hey, wow. Well, listen, I want you to know that actually everything of that nature has a home and a place on Dennis who Invest, my friend, cool. with regards to inspiring people and sharing messages such as the one that you just described, people that are going to help the community and what have you. So yeah, looking forward to what you have in store. And yeah, just saying that there's doors are open on that one for certain, just like how we collaborated together on this podcast today. Paul, I think that that's a really lovely note to end this podcast on. Is there anything that you would like to say to wrap up or all good in the hood? Uh, do you know, all, all good in the hood, uh, but by all means, you know, if you um, if you want to get in touch for any advice or anything like that, I'm, I'm always open. Um, and I'm sure you're the same, James, uh, you know, a pillar in the community and someone that's, you know, really helping a lot of dentists out there. So thank you for uh, allowing me to be on this podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hey, man, I try and right back at you. Thank you in return. And I'm already looking forward to the next episode, my friend. I hope you have an absolutely smashing Thursday and let's speak again soon. Brilliant, mate. Lovely to speak to you. Take care.